acres of the land on which UNSW Sydney here is built the Bidjigal people of the Aora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to acknowledge the wonderful work of uh, the Indigenous uh, academics at UNSW who led the explanation of um, the voice and uh, highlighted the uh, very important issues about uh, Indigenous rights and uh, uh, for Australia in, in that campaign, which I think 5 million people understood their arguments, which was which was good, but if only more, more had. Anyway, um, so I acknowledge and pay my respects to them. So these lectures are held by the Scientia Education Academy. That's a group of 50 or so of the most highly respected teachers across UNSW, the people who are respected for their contribution to teaching and the student experience. We usually get about 100 people online for these events. Uh, and I want to thank Dorota for uh, organizing them, Remy, and uh, Laura Nierengarten. Now, Laura's given me great notes here, and we've had them since 2018. And the other thing I have to tell you is that we'll be recording this lecture, um, including this sort of introductory prattle, which I do in order to just make sure everyone gets online and um, is ready for the main event. We will record it. There'll be a transcript. It'll be made available sometime after the event. If you don't want to be recorded, just don't say anything and don't put your camera on and then effectively you'll be opting out of that. So I think that's fine. Uh, you can make questions in the chat and things, and that'll be useful at the end. So I'm about to pass on to Professor Patsy Polly, but let me just say I'm absolutely delighted that we have uh, Dr. Molly Dollinger here today from uh, Deakin University. Patsy will introduce her in full, but I was so pleased to see the title of her talk, Making Sense of Data in a Complex Higher Education Era. You know, during the last five years, I've seen UNSW um, sort of come up to speed with collecting data, compiling data, and we're now at the stage that I'd say we're thoroughly overwhelmed by data and we are trying to use the data to guide our efforts and sort of extract the wisdom from the data. And I think Molly and her title certainly put a uh, finger on an absolutely key issue. But let me now go on to mute and invite Professor Patsy Polly to introduce uh, our speaker. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you for that overview. And it, it really is our great pleasure to have Dr. Molly Dollinger with us today as uh, to deliver our Science uh, Academy lecture. And Molly is a senior lecturer within the Learning Futures team at Deakin University, and is an early career higher education researcher and educator with a focus to improve equity and inclusion in our classrooms, campuses, and systems. Central to her approach is a commitment to participatory design methodology, including students as partners and co-design methods, which recognize and embed the lived experiences of participants to generate new ideas and solutions. She has previously led the creation of two university-wide uh, student, students as partners programs and has applied her passion for inclusion and co-design towards research on a range of higher education topics, including learning analytics, student governance, and graduate employability. So without much further delay, I would like to hand over to Molly. Over to you, Molly. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the lands upon which I'm joining from today, the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kula Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So my talk today will largely be based off the keynote I gave this year at Herza, where I argued that not only do the paradigm wars still exist in higher education, but they are still raging. And you might be wondering right now why I chose a topic like this. And I did so because while my research interests, as Patsy mentioned, are quite broad from student partnership and equity and so on, I have frequently fallen upon the same question, and maybe you have too. 
which is why do our problems in higher education continue to persist? And I have become increasingly convinced that the answer lies not with our lack of knowledge, but with our lack of respect for diverse knowledges. For some context to this talk, Herds of the Conference, for which this talk was originally designed for, is an audience of largely higher education professional and academic staff working in third space, people working in academic development or learning design teams. The conference also gets a fair amount of discipline academics who might be presenting a project on the scholarship of learning and teaching. Now, I understand that today is a slightly different audience, but I've kept the talk pretty similar to the original version with the aims falling along two lines. The first aim is to take a really traditionally highbrow discussion of epistemologies, i.e. the paradigm wars, and make it practical for academics and professionals, as we are all increasingly asked to be evidence informed in the work that we do, which subsequently makes how we understand data incredibly important. And the second aim, which stems from the first, is thinking about shifting the conversation, as Merlin mentioned, to reflect beyond what data we have, be that retention, satisfaction, enrollment, so on, to the much more critical question of what data should inform our decision making. And I know this is something that Merlin is passionate about, passionate about because I've read and enjoyed his wonderful post in future campus that I think is going to be shared right now in the chat. And in this post, he reflected on the perils of metrics and neoliberalism that is often uncritically accepted in our sector. And I encourage all of you to look it up after today. On the slide here, I also have a picture of the draft accord report here to serve as a reminder about the that the future state of higher education is up for debate. Now, when I get asked about the Accord Report, I typically say that I'm not expecting any huge changes necessarily, as often comes with government reports. But I think the very production of the Accord itself signals that government and industry and society are all ready for higher education to change. In other words, now is a very good time for us to be reflecting on what we do, why we do it, and the data we use to inform it. So I'll begin. In 1989, if you were an educational researcher, there was no larger topic of discussion or debate than what was known as the paradigm wars. For those of you unfamiliar with this topic, which raged for arguably two decades or up to a hundred years beforehand, the paradigm wars were a division between educational researchers and teachers about whether the field of education, including higher education, could truly be a science like biology or engineering. As summarized by Nathaniel Gage, on the one side, we had the social behavioralists, often from psychology or learning sciences, what a lay person might call a quantitative researcher, who designed research studies with methods like randomized control trials. And they told us, Teaching and learning is like any other natural phenomenon. We must take a measured, rational approach to understand it. In other words, there is an objective, universal truth out there, and we can discover it. And on the other side, you had what many would refer to as the qualitative researchers, who were actually quite a diverse group and who, in fact, didn't all agree with each other, but they included the critical theorists, the interpretivists, the anti-naturalists, and so on. And they said, no, no, no. You can't treat teaching and learning like a science. That's ridiculous. People and their multiple identities are dynamic and multifaceted, in play with social, cultural, and interpersonal forces and contexts. And they can only tell us what they think they are feeling or happened. And goodness knows they might act one way one day, and completely differently another day. In other words, the world is subjective and pluralist, and it's complicated. And what emerged from these wars is a term we're all very comfortable with today, called mixed methods. Because essentially what happened is scholars said this war, it is impractical. 
We're not getting anything done. We're not learning anything because we're just at each other's throats. We should be more pragmatic. And that's why you might read quite a few articles in higher education today, taking a pragmatic approach with mixed methods. It's the ideological middle child. But what I want to scrutinize today is the question of whether mixed methods really did end the war. So as I speak, I'd like you, the audience, to reflect on these two questions. The first being, is qualitative data respected equally to quantitative data in our higher education research and decision-making? Spoiler, I'm going to argue not. And second, how has or has not mixed methods actually challenged researchers to build and develop their meta-reflexivity into the quality of data? And my fear here being that the structure of mixed methods has rather paradoxically eroded our ability as researchers to critically reflect on what data we use and instead has encouraged us to adopt step-by-step -step or paint-by-numbers approaches to our research methods. Now, I am not the first to pose such questions, as some of you may know. For example, Professor Lisa Given from RMIT in a paper entitled, It's a New Year, So Let's Stop the Paradigm Wars, discussed this very topic. And she argued that the paradigm wars are still discernible even in the daily actions that occur within the university. For example, staff preferring data sets with large sample sizes, or ethics committees asking researchers to consider how they will maintain objectivity in a research project. These are terms or requirements which adhere to quantitative data and make sense for that realm, but they are not relevant for research that adopts a qualitative paradigm. And the result of this is that we're now in this uneven playing field within our own university structures for qualitative researchers who want to have the same impact or influence as our quantitative peers. After all, what is a mere six interviews, albeit longitudinal, compared to a survey with a Likert scale style question completed by a thousand students. And this being November, where discovery grant outcomes just were announced the other day, it is also timely to reflect on the manifestation of the paradigm wars in the Australian Research Council. I have on the screen here recent work from Dr. Wendy Bastelich from the University of South Australia, who published this year in HERD. And in this work, she highlighted how the disparity between what is good research often plays out in our research policy and political discourse. For example, she writes that the ARC, which I remind you has a mandate to support research that engages with local communities, has a noticeable preference to fund research projects that adopt methodologies aimed to describe things like casual mechanisms, determinants, processes, to build or test theories. And that often this includes, as we saw earlier this week with the four funded AI grants, big data, computational modeling, or large national or multinational quantitative surveys, indicating that the logic of the ARC and its committees too readily endorses that the objective social research methodologies can represent the real condition of the social world. And today, I wanna to discuss not only how this divide impacts our research, which hopefully you can see now, but also how it impacts how we design for the student experience. Take, for example, the increasingly pertinent question of how do we engage our students? Many universities, yours included, no doubt, is asking themselves this very question and interestingly are struggling to find the answer. But it was before COVID that the student experience quilt data here in Australia indicated poor results and stagnation in the dimension of learner engagement. As shown on the slide here, before 2020, the learner engagement metric on the quilt data for undergraduate students 
was already the lowest item on the student experience, at 60% of students giving it a positive rating in 2019. In 2020, that dropped to 44%. But compare that to teaching quality, which would have also been heavily impacted by the move to online and was 81% in 2019 and only dropped to 78% in 2020. And actually, even with the return to campus post-COVID, learner engagement for commencing students nationally, on average, has only rebounded five percentage points. However, here's the kicker. We actually do know how to improve learner engagement, and we've known for years. It's just been hiding in a different paradigm, in a different discourse. And the scholars in this sphere, they don't use the term learner engagement, but rather refer to the term student belongingness. And unlike learner engagement, this concept of belongingness is very difficult to measure. In fact, the very opposite, with most researchers stressing, all that coming from a very different epistemic underpinning, the complexities of it. It's something around how students feel connected, if they feel respected, heard, seen. Conceptualizations also describe belongingness as feeling at home, feeling safe, an emotional attachment. And going all the way back to 1988, Ku and Witt, at the height of the Paradigm Wars, likened this unnameable feeling to the invisible tapestry of college culture. Elusive, complex, and yet incredibly important to why some students succeed and others won't. And even though we don't know exactly what belongingness is or how to phrase it as an item on the quilt survey scale, we actually do know quite a lot about how to do it. For example, it's been well evidenced, largely by qualitative scholars, that the teacher-student relationship is absolutely vital to belongingness, a game changer, especially for equity-deserving student cohorts. Likely, many of you know the work of people such as Peter Felton and Kelly Matthews, who have published extensively on this very topic. Yet, despite the decades-long evidence on the importance of teacher-student relationships to foster belongingness, i.e. engagement, we still don't consistently practice it. In fact, at many universities, staff struggle to find the time and emotional workload to deeply engage and talk to their students. As captured recently on the screen there by higher education reporter Caitlin Cassidy, in this Guardian article. I myself, as mentioned in my bio, have run two university-wide Students as Partners programs and can tell you from the library to the disciplines to the HR and even the infrastructure department, our staff, they want to partner with students. They simply can't find the time. It's not how our work is organized, acknowledged, or rewarded. And so, what this example showcases is that the paradigm wars are alive and well in our sector. We have on the one hand, ongoing discussions about how to improve learner engagement, while on the other hand, decades long research on the importance of teacher-student relationships to improve engagement. So reflecting here, why is it that we have the answer right in front of us, but we're not changing? Why is it that one side of the divide isn't getting through to the other? Well, this is at least in part due to our epistemic differences, where the data or research arising from post-positivist is ignored by those who might be interpretivists and vice versa. And stuck in between these discourses, of which there are more than two, I might add, but I wanted to make the slide nice and pretty, these are, there are these really big, wicked problems, which we are so desperately trying to address. Learner engagement, gen AI, academic integrity. The problem, therefore, isn't always that we don't have enough data. I would argue there is, in fact, a wealth of data and knowledge in higher education. 
but that we are not connecting this data. Or should I say equally respecting and actioning this data? And going back to some of the original aims of this talk that I said to you, is the reflection that mixed methods has yet to unite us. But let me stress, the takeaway from today is not about changing your epistemologies. You might be a quantitative researcher and that's great. I couldn't convince you to change your epistemologies anyways. As research from polarizing issues such as climate change to American gun control has shown that a person's bias on how they understand evidence is not changed by intelligence, access to information, or sadly, education. But what we can do is respect and understand the limits of our epistemic beliefs. We can acknowledge what role we can play and the importance of the roles of others. And we can use our meta-reflexivity, our training as researchers, as critical scholars, to engage in boundary crossing. So to begin this story, which in my opinion so beautifully illustrates how we can begin to engage in boundary crossing, I need to first provide a little bit of background. So let me paint the scene. While the quantifiable measurement, collection, and analysis of learners' data for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs has a long history, it was only in 2011 that the term learning analytics truly caught on. Quite popular, if not hyped, I have no doubt some of you remember, learning analytics was full of potential, rooted in this idea that with the rise of digitized data, educators would be able to leverage computational analysis to understand our students. That in the not so distant future, we would have the just in time stats about our students and visualizations and dashboards to track engagement or help students self-regulate their learning. Learning analytics, in fact, in many ways, seem to be the best of both worlds. That with big data, we could aggregate and highlight trends and pain points across the student journey, but at the same time, harness the individualized data to better personalize learning and help us support our increasingly diverse student cohorts. However, all the excitement about learning analytics has been plagued by a lack of evidence of its impact on student learning outcomes. As recently summarized by Leah McFadden in the UK, for over 10 years, Educause Horizon Report, an annual publication that discusses key ed tech trends, has listed learning analytics as an emerging technology. And leading scholars in the field from Rebecca Ferguson and Doug Clow to Olga Weiberg have discussed the lack of institutional wide programs or even peer reviewed evidence demonstrating learning or success at scale. Yet more recently work led by another early career researcher, Dr. Lisa Angelique Lim from the University of Technology, Sydney has helped fill the gap and reinvigorate the field. In her 2021 paper, she and colleagues found that with the use of personalized student emails sent through a platform known as OnTask at key assessment time points, students had more stable engagement across the teaching period as measured through their ebook and ultimately performed better in the class. Let me show you the slide here that explains. So the treatment group or the pilot group had increasing stable engagement, again, measured through that ebook, and the students ultimately received a mark on average of 71%. Pretty good, right? Well, hold on, because in discussing these great findings with Lisa in the lead up to this talk, she told me this research, it didn't tell the full story, that her side of the great divide where her epistemic beliefs encouraged her to use student log data and performance to inform t-tests and linear regressions and growth mixture modeling didn't explain, for example, why the control group actually had much higher engagement with the ebook activity overall, with a dip midway through and then a sharp increase at the end. Yet these students only had a final mark of 62%, considerably lower than the treatment group. So what to make of these results? 
how was it that the student treatment group scored so much higher overall, despite their much lower, albeit more stable, ebook activity? Maybe the students were engaged in resources that weren't included in the study. Maybe there was more out of class peer learning. Maybe they were just really good test takers. It's hard to say, right? So Lisa, she did what so many of us struggle to do. And she took a leap. She crossed the typical boundary of her and her colleagues' epistemic beliefs. And in the next study, Lisa decided to use both student data from their online engagement and in-depth focus groups with students. And by comparing and equally valuing each set of data, she and colleagues were able to use the qualitative data to explore conflicting or unexpected results from the analysis of the trace data. In particular, they learned that while the trace data appeared to document lower student engagement overall, this was because the students were actually using the personalized emails as the resources. In other words, it was the messages themselves from their teachers that was meaningful to students and that was driving their learning. And the intervention was working, just not in the way they expected. So the takeaway here is that it took the appreciation for the value of qualitative data integrated with the equally valuable quantitative data to truly understand this complex phenomenon. Okay, so you might be thinking, big deal, they did mixed methods. But what they did here was actually quite radical and something I don't see occurring in many of the big wicked problems in our sector, which is that they harness their epistemic beliefs, which I pointed out are integral to their identities as researchers. And when they found discrepancies in the data, they leaped across the divide to appreciate a different kind of knowledge. Now, this is something hopefully all of us with a PhD have been trained to do, but it rarely gets done because our biases, our social groups, our sector's love of new public management approaches, they all make it difficult for us to truly integrate diverse knowledges in our daily context, even if we nominally understand the importance of this. And what scares me is that sometimes mixed methods, the very thing that we are in theory trying to achieve, is actually devaluing rather than valuing our diverse knowledges. Case in point, the plethora of mixed methods research, which as Lynn Giddings has pointed out, is simply positivism dressed in drag. For example, making a survey and tacking on an open-ended question at the end and calling it mixed methods. Or take, for example, recent work by Felix Nappersbusch, a postdoctoral research fellow from Germany, who raises concerns over this idea to see mixed methods as a third paradigm. He reflected that rather than confront difficult conversations across paradigms, researchers seem preoccupied with finding clinical, almost textbook-like ways to just ignore our differences and get along, to follow predetermined steps like survey plus discursive interview, ethnography plus grid analysis plus scaling, think aloud narrative plus card sort plus factor analysis. As Felix reflects, this arguably does more harm than good. Research shouldn't be an algorithm. It should support researchers' meta-reflexivity to interrogate what data will be collected, the quality of that data, and ultimately how the findings represent the voices and experiences of the participants who chose to share it. This is not something that can be outsourced to Gen AI which as many have noted is susceptible to data bias and discrimination. For example, the book I have on the slide here by Carolyn Chiara Perez talking about the harm that data can do to women. And so the alternative to this and what I would like to stress to you today is to become meta-reflexive researchers and leaders. I'm summarizing work here by Weber, but this means practicing three forms of reflexivity in our work. The first is being meta-theoretical. I ask you as a quick exercise now to consider what your epistemologies are, what beliefs you have about the world and what that means. Again, this doesn't mean changing them or trying to adopt more than one, but just considering your place in the larger ecosystem of knowledge. 
Second is theoretical reflexivity, reflecting on the constructs and the boundaries that we use to make sense of the world. As in the example I gave earlier around learner engagement and belongingness, which often form very specific discourses of scholars that unfortunately are divided by these keywords rather than working together to address a similar phenomenon. And finally, being more like Lisa in the example I gave with our interpretation reflexivity, reflecting on our assumptions, our biases in the data. And really, and I, I wanna highlight this, considering whose voice is prominent in our data, whose voices and experiences are we and are we not? capturing. Now, you see on the slide here, I also wrote this up as a radical alternative, because while I acknowledge it is, to many of us, simply good research practice, it is also searingly at odds with how our research is created and funded and measured. And if you want to be a meta-reflexive scholar in our system, I would argue that's actually quite hard to achieve. So when I gave this talk originally, as some of you maybe were there, the audience questions were perhaps unsurprisingly, okay, so now what? Where to from here? And a lot of the questions I got were around structural change. For example, okay, I, I agree with all of this, but how do I change my senior leader's point of view? How do I change my university's strategic priorities or the journal publishing practices in my field and, and so on? Well, all I can say is that we can only start with ourselves and our immediate realm of influence. And here are my suggestions, but I'm hoping in this room of experts that we can also discuss some of the ideas you might have as well. The first relates to practicing more epistemic modesty, described by Canadian psychologist Thomas Teo as being aware of your own horizon, the strengths and limitations of your approach, while being knowledgeable about the history, sociality, and culturality of knowledge, which if you ask me is not modest, it's bold. In daily practice, that means being critical of your research, questioning any clear research findings you might have, avoiding confirmation bias. It also means greater collaboration with researchers from different epistemic beliefs to truly unpack our wicked problems. Second, I think being a reflexive researcher means more consideration not only on what we do, but the context in which we do it. As I've written about before, I sometimes find it odd that in academia, a place where there are so many bright, critical minds, we are often very uncritical, very passive of our structures, how we accept workload and measures of productivity. To give an example, I have written about the projectification of our sector or the increasingly dominant view of time, which as the name implies, thinks of time as linear, measurable, seeking milestones or KPIs. Now I acknowledge that may work in industry, but I'm not convinced it's suitable for the production of knowledge. And in my opinion, it's made us forget what universities truly are and what we should stand for. Things like criticality, dissent, open debate, which might not move linear at all times. And finally, I'm sure like many others, I've been moved by the recent work of scholars such as Miranda Fricker and Luvelle Anderson on this idea of testimonial or epistemic injustice. As researchers, we have a duty to bring story to people's truths, to ensure their participation in our work is respected and that something comes out of it. I think about this all the time when I do research on student equity or student partnership. How do we create research designs from recruitment, analysis, to the reporting of our data that do our communities justice? All right, and to wrap things up now, I concluded this talk originally by linking it back to the work of Associate Professor Barbara Grant, who I heard speak at my first HERDSA conference. She spoke of the idea that we are all the university, and every day, whether we realize it or not, we transform the university through the actions we choose to take. So to conclude on the slide here, I wanted to highlight just a few of the other amazing ECRs whose work inspires me. And some of these people have very different epistemic beliefs than me. And yet I look forward to continuing the study of higher education with them. So thank you. And if you're interested in hearing more about these thoughts, 
I also have put the paper from the keynote on the screen here. Well, thank you very much, Molly. That was a very thought provoking, super interesting talk. Your talk is now open for questions. So if anyone's got some questions, please raise their hand or drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. Feel free to interact. Anything popping up at the moment. So I might just ask the first question, Molly, if I may. I like um, your uh, comment on the KPIs and how we as academics may actually be struggling to meet the concept of KPIs because production and development of knowledge is not linear. So how do we uh, operate in a world that confines us somehow by a system of KPIs and yet we are still knowledge producers and, you know, and, and transmitters in a way in our classrooms? Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes into this debate of how universities choose to value their internal research processes. So, you know, I'm obviously not a DVCA or PVC, but I would like to think that the same rigor we would bring to something that we're going to publish is the same rigor that we would bring internally as well. So that's acknowledging that that requires workload, that requires the time to go and see what's been done, to think about the context, to think carefully about the intervention or what it is that we're you know, looking into, and then acknowledging that it might take time to do it properly as opposed to you know, if it's going to be done in the 2030 plan or, or something like that. And I understand that that's really hard to push back on because of the way universities now run, but I think it's probably time for us to all be having those conversations because like I pointed out in the talk, we're having the same discussions about how to improve learner engagement, how to improve student equity, all of these things over and over again. So I would argue that while it seems like we're moving quicker, we're, we're probably actually wasting time as opposed to um, really thinking about these issues more thoughtfully. Thank you for that. But wouldn't actually the whole idea of producing knowledge and, and engaging in research and also this process-driven approach, that, I mean, they intersect, surely. I mean, in terms of the, the final um, goal is to have a, a better university environment no matter what, right? Yeah, absolutely. So questions from the audience. Any questions? Let me have a look. I've got a couple here. So Silas, you've got a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it out or would you like to put your hand up? I can oh. I can read it just as well. Oh, thank I mean, you. We were having a bit of a sidebar discussion at one point, Molly. Um, thanks very much for an interesting talk um, about, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, saying, you know, perhaps, um, our, you know, student engagement is drifting away because they find our teaching boring. And I was uh, reflecting on what you were saying uh, at the time, which was it's the teacher student relationship, which is key. So rather, again, jokingly, I said to May, well, is it us that is boring, in fact, personally to the students? Um, but I think more broadly, and, and I think that is, a, is my question, um, you know, what does it say about us as people, academics in, in a university, but perhaps also what does it say about the institution more broadly and its rel relevance to young people um, in, the, in the modern day? Well, I mean, I don't know about your university experience, but I had some incredibly boring teachers in my undergraduate uh, university experience. So no, I don't think we're less boring. I, you know, I might be biased here, but I think we're probably more interesting than ever. I mean, there's more diversity in academia than ever. And I think that's interesting. But I think it's more about the fact when I'm talking about relationships, that we're not given the time as teachers to engage with our students. You know, the, the work academic model, the WAM, for example, it doesn't um, place any time aside to form meaningful relationships with our students to get to know their names, to 
have drop-in sessions with them, find out about their hobbies, why they're taking the course, all of these things that would drive their engagement. So I, I certainly don't mean to say that anyone is uh, is boring. And I think anyone can really be a great teacher with the right tools um, and time and support in order to do so. Uh, I think it's more around, you know, thinking about how we are allowed and supported and even encouraged to take the uh, the unmeasured time of our day, the the conversations with students and so on, and and have that be valued and have that be understood as a key part of our job. Great, thank you. It's very true, Molly. I mean, I sometimes feel like I'm competing with TikTok to get some messages across, and I, I don't really think I'd be very good on TikTok, so I would fail no matter what. So I would prefer to stay in my classroom and have that relationship built with students uh, within the university context and maybe build it into the way we work, um, which a lot of us do, by the way. It's just a question of having it measured in terms of the time that we take to do that, as you say. So there is another question in the chat and Rosalie's asked the question. So Rosalie, would you like to ask a question or would you, would you be happy for me to read it? Response, yeah, so I'll read it for Rosalie. Oh, it's disappeared. Okay, remembering that universities are not monoliths, they are made up of people. How do we as academics push back on the metrics? Or well, I might actually add, do we indeed need to push back on the metrics? Yeah, I think we do need to push back on the metrics. Um, you know, I think... Like I said, I mean, it goes a lot to this idea that really, you know, when you look at how universities and the idea of the universities has evolved, we've become more and more like industry, this new public management idea. And at first, the KPIs were good because I'm sure, I mean, I, I didn't work in academia in the 80s or 90s, but I can imagine for those of you that did, you know, there were probably a few academics who it was unclear what they were doing, how they were contributing, um, you know, and so on. So the KPIs in some ways, sort of stabilized a bit of this conversation where we could start having conversations about someone's really good at teaching, someone's really good at research, other people spend a lot of time in service, for example. But there gets to a point where they then start to do more harm than good because not everything falls so clearly into these three categories and not everything can be measured. Um, and so I think it's more about accepting that. And I don't know the culture at University of New South Wales, but having more discussions both in the school level and the faculty level about how success is rewarded, what's looked at with that. I mean, I think as an example, the Advanced HE um, program, which, you know, has academics reflect on their teaching from a personal point of view, tell stories, talk about how they've implemented change or considered, you know, reflecting on their own teaching and so on. These are really good initiatives that show that it's very complex and not, not everything can be turned into a number. Yeah, that's, that's very relevant. We've got at, at our university, we've got My Education Portfolio, which uh, is a space where uh, educators and academics can start to reflect on their um, teaching practice in terms of developing their own best practice over time. So that's very yeah useful to hear that from you also. So May, May, you've got a question. Would you like me to ask it for you? Or do you want to put your hand up? Okay, the obligatory three seconds of silence, May. Here you are. Hi, May. Mic, mic on. Can't hear you. Ooh. Okay. I'll ask the question then, May. How do you engage your peers and leaders at Deakin, Molly? So have you got a mechanism that you could share with us? You mean engage them like to have conversations like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, this is a great forum. We have similar forums at Deakin as well. So teaching and learning days, we have 
communities of practice, all of these types of things. We, we go to conferences together, obviously have a bit of a WeChat, WhatsApp chat going as well. So all of those are really great mechanisms. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and, and May's got a follow-up, but how do you feed that information back up to the management? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of our management are pretty down to earth and, and attend our communities of practice and so on, much like your management is here today. Um, so I think the communication gets through. I think it's just these things do take time. Um, I'm probably a little biased, but I would say that the deacon, I think, is doing a good job of understanding the complexities of this space. Oh, Merlin has a question, so. So thanks, Molly. So thanks for your, your talk. I've been thinking about it because, you know, you're right about metrics are useful up to a point. I think they were useful. You know, when I started, we had an age of God professors. And if you were sort of part of the established God professor, you could you could exert power and you could exert power for good or for not so good. Once the metrics came, I think it did allow some new blood to be identified and people to gain uh, confidence and to be recognized through their peers. So if the God professor didn't like you, if you had good metrics associated with you, you could thrive even if um, you were a bit of an outsider. I think it was good, but I also agree with you that it can go too far and it can become pernicious. And I I very much think that uh, the complete invasion of metrics into every aspect of what we do sort of has occurred across industry and universities. Um, I'm not sure how different we are from some good industries, but it has happened. I don't know what the answer to it is, but I do think it's partly related to scale as we've become massive, it's sort of, if you have a local football team and you know all the players, you probably don't need to know their statistics. But when you get to the stage, you can't watch every game yourself. You just haven't got time. And someone has to decide who's going to get the Brownlow medal. They, they say it's always for the best and fairest. And they make some attempt to measure the best on the metrics and on people watching. The fairness usually means you haven't been reported and gone before the tribunal. Uh, you know, so it's it's not really a best and fairness, but I think it's to do with scale. The problem with scale is that everyone believes that universities can become, cover their increasing costs, the costs of increasing cost of teaching, increased, increasing cost of research because of technology by increasing scale. I'm not sure that's absolutely true but I haven't got a way of shrinking the university. If I could, I'd make the university smaller. And I think that would reduce our reliance on metrics, but I haven't got a way of doing that without inflicting enormous pain. But it's good that we discuss these things. Thanks for your talk. Thank you, yeah, I, I might just hand over to Alex. Thanks, Holly. I, did, I, I was having so many thoughts listening to your talk because I was remembering back to when I was a, you know, an ACR and the way I saw the university and how it was big and evil and I was on the picket lines and, and now I'm sort of in evil management. And it, it, the, the, the one, and also when I first started um, in the, in the mid-90s, hearing the stories about what it was like to be an academic in the 70s and 80s and how amazing it was and just wishing, just thinking, you know, I was I was born too late and I had to work so much harder than anybody else. And of course, for the next generation, it's, I can't believe what you guys got away with and, you know, you didn't have to really research and you could hang out with the students and that kind of stuff. So I think there's this age, this endless sort of, you know, um, grass is greener sort of issue, which I, I don't, I don't want to say that to diminish the struggles and the, and the difficulties that we have today, because I think what technology has done is it has just sort of um, really amplified the amount of surveillance and the amount of sort of um, pressure on people. And, and we we really do need to find an answer for the, the relentlessness of what's expected of us now. Um, but to, to, to go back to more about what you were talking about and sort of the, the thoughts that it that provoked for me were that in lots of ways, the paradigm wars and the mixed methods approaches um, 
they're all sort of dealing, I think, with the same fundamental thing, and that is, um, as you say, the, the epistemological look, um, view that people have on life and the lack of, humil lack of humility that people have. So in order to be a researcher, you have to back yourself, you have to make a, a strong argument, you have to go through peer, um, peer review. So by the time you've actually published something, it's too late to actually say, oh, actually, I didn't get that right. So what we do is we force ourselves into strong positions and people then get into these doctrine wars about, well, you know, I'm a quant, I'm a qual, um, I don't believe in anthropology. You know, those sorts of sort of things, particularly in the humanities, really tend to st start to, to bite. And I think what you're saying is really important, that we've really got to step back from our favourite methodology and we've actually got to accept that there are other ones and, and we really just need to recognise that no one person's view of the world is the complete view and and part of actually trying to find a way for us to all live together is to actually accept that everybody sees things differently and 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 i think one of the difficulties um with management is that the more people you've got to manage the less time you've got it's exactly what mel was talking about with scale if you're teaching a class of 20 students you can get to know everybody if you're teaching a class of 800 you will try to do something, but it's never going to be the same level. And management is always the same. So management don't have a way of actually being able to talk to everybody. So the real the real trick to this is to actually find ways for um, people at the coalface to actually be able to speak to management in ways that are positive and give management a way of actually thinking about something differently. So if you keep saying to management, this is broken, I hate what you're doing, it's terrible, it's terrible, you'll get a defensive reaction. But if you, you talk to management and say, this this could be better if we did this, then that sort of plants a seed of hope, I think, in management that maybe maybe one decision one day will actually be the right decision. So I, I think what, what you're saying is fantastic and, and, and great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I didn't put this in today because I was wanted to keep the talk short, but in the original talk, I talk a lot about student partnership because I've run these big programs and, you know, we get 30 students, 40 students, you know, looking for diversity, all of that, you know, in a room, we talk to them, they come up with ideas, suggestions, this is, this would make things better and so on. And then we bring that to senior leaders and they go, that's 40 students. Why, why would I make changes based on what 40 students have to say? So even, Alex, as you're speaking about, you know, the importance of, you know, thinking about different epistemologies and understanding the diversity and so on. It's very hard in the scale of the university to convince some people that numbers, the numbers of participants is not necessarily, you know, the most valuable data that we should be harnessing. I mean, I think a lot of the quilt data, I spent a lot of time on the quilt website as a higher education researcher. And it doesn't tell you very much, it, you know, and yet universities, whether it's QS or Quilt or the Good Universities Guide or whatever course, we get like very, very fixated on these um, these rankings and these metrics of our quality, you know, but we have all these other routes that we could be using to talk about some of these issues like Gen AI and so on. And they're just hard. They're not getting through um, because they're not being valued on the same level. Very true, Molly. Thank you for that comment. We also have a bit of commentary in the chat from Laura. Laura, would you like to turn your mic on and ask about um, the idea of processes that impact academics in terms of promotion? Oh, but that's very local to UNSW, and I think the talk was much more broader than that. I was just thinking that at UNSW, the um, promotion process drives so many things and so it's a little bit like like the metrics I would like a little bit less of that and I'm terrified to see my colleagues who say well when you apply for promotion put one month aside when you don't do anything useful to anyone except put this thing together and please lie a bit on it to look better than you are and that makes me sick well we don't want to be lying that's for sure so but the metrics I, I can see your point, but they also, the boundaries and the expectations do, I guess, help us um, get some sort of pathway under control, especially if we're doing a lot of different activities. So I can see the point of that. Lucy, you've got a question in the chat as well. Do you think all researchers, would you like to uh, ask that question? Or are you happy for me to? Yes, uh, Lucy, hi. 
Hi, hi. Um, I have just add broader context. I came up through a, a corporate market research graduate training and we all used to hang out together. We all went through the same training and the quants and the quals and, and so on. And so I'm curious in academia whether there, there is much happening to educate researchers at the start of their journey on different methods and, and pros and cons. And then beyond that, um, proactive collaborations to kind of to, to keep people listening to each other with um, with objectives in mind. Yeah, I mean, Lucy, great question. And I often wonder what more we should be doing in the United States. Um, I did my PhD here, but in the United States, there's much more general education before you start your dissertation where you have to take methodology classes that, you know, give you a range of a little bit of knowledge of each of them. In the Australian system, unfortunately, um, you don't see that. So you see a lot of people who really only know the methodology that they used in their thesis. So that's hugely problematic. And then, of course, it only gets worse because then people go to conferences. They put in journals that, of course, are affiliated with the methodology that they use. And then they become more, you know, <laughs> indoctrined into that methodology. Uh, I always think with conferences, for example, wouldn't it be great if they didn't tell you what the presentations were in the room. You just went and sat in a room and you got what you got and maybe it'd be good for you. Um, but unfortunately, of course, that's not how it works. So I think, you know, talking about promotions or talking about measures of success, what about, you know, rewarding researchers who publish cross-disciplinary research, thinking about people who use, you know, collaborations with people from different epistemologies and so on. Like, why can't these also be measures that we look at? Very true, Molly. And I always wonder, uh, with, you mentioned the mixed method idea as the third paradigm and whether we need to, um, I guess, not workshop, but, yeah, get more work out that challenges reviewers as well, not, not to think in, in a box, but to think that there's another way of doing. So this brings us to the end of our talk. Uh, thank you very, very much, Molly, for a stimulating uh, talk and also inciting discussion in our audience. So thank you very much for that. Today we learned about learner engagement, actually the new, new term being student belongingness. We learned that learning analytics has probably been overturned by personalised emails, which I, I tend to like as well um, in terms of making contact with students. And again, the whole idea that the, the teacher-student relationship is so important. So thank you very much, uh, Molly, once again. And I guess, colleagues, if we need um, more contact with Molly, I guess you'd be happy to um, accept people's emails and contact. I'm sure that would be okay. Everyone, uh, we've got a bit of uh, a survey happening left in the chat. Uh, if you've got a minute or so to spare, thank you for your time in advance if you could uh, address some of the questions in that survey. And once again, Molly, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All the best.